nice morning. I want to sit outside, but I think I'm like right where people are walking by. <laughs> We're almost there. Okay, and we are live. Hi, web shadowers. Sorry for a little bit of a late start. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Andrew Chung, who is a spinal surgeon. As always, please remember that the Google form will be posted in the chat box at the end of the session. With that being said, Dr. Chung, you can get started whenever you're ready. Awesome, thanks, Sophia. Um, the, the late start is my fault, so I apologize. Um, to Sophia and the, the web shadowers um, group. I think it's amazing what uh, they've done here uh, to make these opportunities available for you. I know it kind of sucks um, that you guys aren't able to do this in person, but um, um, that, you know, they were as Sophia said I'm a, a spinal surgeon uh, so specifically I'm a fellowship trained orthopedic spine surgeon um, I actually started out interestingly in uh, chiropractic school uh, and then brief in there in biology and just kind of giving my back of osteopathic medicine, uh, actually the Georgia campus, uh, and then Yeah. Hi, Dr. Chung. I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hold on, let me do this. I don't know what's going on with our... No problem. Problems with Zoom. Totally understandable. Internet here at Cedars is so bad, but uh, how about now? Is any better? I can hear you better now. You're still a little bit choppy. That's definitely smoother. Smoother? I, th I think I just had to move a little bit. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Am I still sharing or no? There we go. Good? All good. All right. So I don't know where I cut off there, but um, just to start over here. Um, as Sophia introduced, um, a fellowship trained orthopedic spine surgeon. Um, actually started out in chiropractic college, uh, interestingly, and then uh, decided that I wanted to pursue medicine. So just got my uh, science degree from there. Uh, and then just given my background, um, decided to pursue a DO um, degree at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, completed my orthopedic surgery training at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. Uh, and then did a spine fellowship uh, with both uh, orthopedic 
and uh, neurosurgical uh, spine surgeons at the University of Southern California. And then currently, just because I am a glutton for punishment, uh, I'm doing another six month uh, advanced fellowship uh, at Cedar sinai uh, Docs Hospital. And then I'll be moving back to, to Phoenix Scottsdale area to start um, setting up roots uh, in, in January. So uh, just briefly, you know, I think there's some confusion as to what a spine surgeon is and how do you become a spine surgeon? Uh, well, you can take the better route, which was, which was mine, uh, going uh, the orthopedic route, which is five to six years of training uh, with an additional year of specialized uh, spine training. Um, and and I, I say that uh, jokingly, of course. Um, but uh, in orthopedic uh, surgery, um, and I don't know why, I think when I copied and pasted this slide over from um, another slide deck to this one, it kind of messed it up. But um, any case, uh, so orthopedic surgery residency, um, basically during our training, we learn how to fix broken bones. Uh, we do joint replacement, so hip and knee replacements, you know, put in art artificial joints. Uh, for any of you that are you know, interested in sports or pay attention to sports, um, May have heard of like ACL injuries, uh, various shoulder injuries like rotator cuff tears. Um, we learn how to fix those. Uh, we do hand surgery. We do foot and ankle surgery. Um, we do tumor surgery of the muscles and bones, um, and um, we even do uh, pediatric uh, orthopedic surgery, which is a cool specialty where um, you know you deal with kids that have you know broken bones and so on and so forth. Um, but also, uh, there's a lot of kiddos that uh, have uh, limb deformities or um, have issues, orthopedic issues as a result of various uh, syndromes. Uh, and so we, we, uh, we learn how to kind of treat those um, kiddos as well. Uh, and so we, we, we really do a lot during uh, orthopedic residency. Um, and so we don't get to focus as much on spine as, as for instance, somebody like me might wanna, wanna focus on, but, um, or spend as much time on spine as we'd like to. Uh, so we, ultimately end up having to do an extra year of fellowship. And again, that's dedicated and you just do spine during that year. Um, and after that, you're a uh, fellowship trained spine surgeon. On the flip side, you could do a neurosurgical residency. They deal with uh, mainly the brain and then also the spine. Uh, their residency is longer, it's about seven to eight years. Uh, so by the time they're actually done with residency, they've actually done, in most cases, um, uh, quite a few spine cases and so uh, a lot of these guys can come out and, and, and perform spine surgery without having to do a fellowship. That being said, um, you know, if you want to work in an academic center or uh, some hospital settings, they still have to do a year of spine fellowship. The end product nowadays really is no different. So if you go to the major spine societies, um, so we have like these almost like clubs or associations where all the spine surgeons hang out. Um, the most famous spine surgeons, the most, you know, well-known, you know, spine surgeons like the LeBron James or, uh, you know, the uh, Russell Wilsons, if you will, of spine, surgeon, spine surgery uh, are both uh, orthopedic and uh, neurosurgical uh, spine surgeons. So really, there's no difference. And in fact, we kind of cross train. Uh, so for instance, uh, last year, uh, I trained with both neurosurgeons and uh, orthopedic spine surgeons. So it's a long road, but it's well worth it. So what do we do? Uh, we deal with um, the operative and also non-operative management of various spine conditions. So arthritis, the neck and back, uh, you may have heard of disc herniations, um, spinal deformities, which are pictured, which, uh, which one of which is pictured here. Uh, you know, we straighten these out. Um, somebody's got a broken back or neck, uh, we fix these things. Uh, and then also tumors, not only of the bones of the spine, um, but also uh, of the you know, spinal cord, uh, and uh, of the nerves uh, within the spine. Although um, if you guys had to kind of ask what's a fundamental difference still between the orthopedic and, and neurosurgical guys and gals, um, this would be it in that this would be one of them uh, in that neurosurgeons tend to deal more with the non bony tumors of the spine. Uh, whereas orthopedic guys typically say, hey, let's uh, we, we kind of stay away from that. But there are guys that do it if you're interested in that. What I love about spine surgery is the anatomy is awesome. So you get a model of a spine, it doesn't look that complex, um, but really every millimeter of anatomy counts in spine. 
So if you're in surgery and, and you move a millimeter in the wrong direction and, and you're drilling, you know, a millimeter, you know, off from where you need to be, you can seriously injure a patient, cause some serious problems. And, and so the anatomy really counts and it's high stakes anatomy and it's intense. And personally, I like that. You know, I like to, you know, be challenged every day. You know, I, I don't want to walk into the OR every single day and just be doing the same thing, same thing, same thing. And, uh, you know, almost it be mechanical where I, I'm not even thinking about it. Um, with spine, you have to bring your A game every day because the anatomy is so intense. Um, and, and for me, that's, you know, what's going to get me out of bed every morning uh, for the rest of my life. At least that, that's how I feel. Um, I think... You know, this is kind of underrated, but the clinic of spine surgery uh, is, is very interesting to me. So, you know, you talk to most surgeons, they don't want to do clinic, right? They, they, want, to, they want to be in surgery. And that's what surgeons want to do. Um, but for me, if I'm going to be in clinic, I want to be in a clinic that I'm interested uh, in and that's going, to, that's going to challenge me. And spine surgical patients are oftentimes a clinical challenge. So you really have to think about what it is that you're um, you know, treating. Um, because as you guys will learn, you know, as you move forward in your careers, um, a pinched nerve in the neck or the back, you know, it can refer pain to the, the, the extremities. Um, but you also have to be aware that there are, you know, issues of the extremities that can cause pain too. So you need to be able to kind of differentiate between that. And so a lot of that comes with, you know, the history uh, as well as the physical exam. And, and uh, you know, again, these patients are diagnostic challenges. And I find that uh, fascinating. Yeah, and I don't need to talk about the surgery. It's, they're, they're cool. You're dealing with, uh, again, high stakes anatomy and you get to use some pretty uh, uh, awesome uh, technologies. Um, so, and you know, the future is bright. So when you look at the history of spine surgery over the last like 10, 15 years, the number of technologies, um, the amount of research that has come out of spine surgery and our understanding of spine surgery has just, uh, just improved by leaps and bounds. And what that means is that there's a lot about spine that we don't understand yet. And so as you guys may see, as you move forward, and something to kind of keep in mind is you may see a patient that has a singular problem in the spine. And that patient may see three or four different spine surgeons and may get two or three different spine surgical plans. And what that means is we just don't have the best answer yet for some of these things, which means that there's still a lot of room for growth um, and there's still a lot of uh, room for improvement, which to me is, is, is awesome, which is, means that um, moving forward, things will, there, there's always gonna be new things coming out and that's gonna keep things interesting. Oh, so I wanted to show you here, if I can, can't see my mouse here, but uh, there you go. So we get to play with robots in the OR now. And now I know like Da Vinci has been around for a while in general surgery and some of these other surgical specialties, but uh, for spine surgery and, and orthopedics, the robot is, is relatively new. Um, and so in any case, uh, you get to play with some cool stuff in spine. I'm gonna kind of breeze through this. Just know that the schedule for a surgeon is, is typically um, variable consists of, you know, some number of OR days, you know, where you're in surgery, obviously, uh, with, uh, you know, a couple of clinic days where you're seeing patients that you've operated on, new patients who may or may not need surgery. Um, and then weekends, you know, typically if you've got patients in house, you need to go and see them. Uh, I would hope that you want to do that. Um, and then, um, you know, this is plus or minus call. If you're a neurosurgeon, typically you're taking a lot of call. Um, <clears throat> More often than not, if you're an orthopedic guy, um, maybe uh, just kind of depends on what you want your um, practice to be like. I <clears throat> just wanted to give you guys a few glimpses of the OR. <clears throat> For those of you who never stepped into the OR, uh, this is what an OR looks like. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but that's me in the back pretending to be important. Uh, here's here's uh, what's called a C-arm. It's uh, basically an X-ray. Uh, intraoperative x-ray. It's kind of what we use to uh, localize within the spine. Because if you see here, this guy's laid out on his front side or what we call prone. And how do we know where in the spine we need to go? Now, you know, 
you can kind of feel with your hands, you know, certain landmarks, but at the end of the day, to really be precise about where you're going, you need some sort of uh, technology to help you localize. So we use uh, oftentimes what's called the C-arm. Um, anesthesia's up here playing video games. Uh, this is a circular, uh, circulating nurse. Um, and then all these monitors uh, we use to kind of, um, depending on the technology that we're using for that day. In this case, um, we used a robot. And so this is uh, the tech that's kind of operating the robot. Um, nurses getting the skin nice and clean before we start uh, cutting skin. Um, just again, some, some images of the types of technologies that we get to use. This is the robot, uh, which I've been using a lot in this fellowship. Didn't use a lot of it until I got here at Cedars. And so it's been pretty cool. Um, but you can see you're like literally drilling holes in the spine. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating, fascinating thing that we get to do. And, and the fact that people let us do that to them uh, is, is, is really cool. So you get to use microscopes if you're working around the nerves and you really want to see up close or if you're working through a small hole. Uh, microscopes really allow you to look up closely at, at what you're doing uh, and, uh, and you know, allow for very um, high precision, uh, precision surgery. Um, kind of before the robot and people are, are using a lot of this still, uh, we used uh, CT navigation, so that's kind of what we're setting up for here. Uh, what that means is um, it's computer navigation. So we'll get a, a scan of the patient inside the OR, like a CT scan, a computed tomography scan. You guys may have heard of that. Um, and then using that, we're able to actually find out where we are in the spine using navigation tools. Uh, so there's a lot of cool things that we get to use in, in spine. I'm wearing a headlamp here, wearing loops, uh, in lieu of a microscope, I can use loops, kind of like magnifying glasses that allow me to see up close uh, in the spine. Uh, here's a drill. This is a, it's called a monopolar or a bovi. Uh, it's like uh, basically a cauterizing uh, knife. So let's briefly talk about some spinal anatomy and then I'd like to get to the cases so that, uh, you know, things are a little bit more exciting for you guys. But when you look at the anatomy of the spine, uh, you've got a lot of, lot of different bones in the spine. Again, you look at this and you're like, oh man, the spine's not that complex. It is. Every millimeter counts. Um, so this is a very broad overview of the anatomy. And I just want you to realize that because um, I don't want you to think what I do is, is you know, a piece of cake. Because <laughs> no, it really, it really is, uh, it really is uh, um, intense anatomy. And, 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 and I, when I say every millimeter counts, I, I really mean that. Uh, but this is what uh, basically the vertebral column looks like or your spine looks like. The spine really has two functions. It keeps you upright so you're not a worm. And then uh, it protects uh, all the, uh, the nerves uh, and the spinal cord. So all the, the you know, electrical wiring to the body that allows you to move your arms and legs uh, is protected by the spine. And you have what's called a cervical spine, which is the neck. You have a thoracic spine, which is kind of your mid-back. Uh, which articulates with the ribs. So your rib cage actually comes off here. Uh, and then the low back is known as the lumbar spine and they're all numbered accordingly. So again, just to kind of show you uh, the, the, like the general overview of the neuroanatomy of the body, including the spine, brain, and then the spinal cord and all the nerves that come off of it are obviously an extension of the brain. So this would be in the cervical spine region this would be in the thoracic spine region. This would be in the lumbar spine. And again, when these nerves come off, they go down and control your arms um, in the neck region and in the, the, the low back region, they control your legs. So they allow you to feel and move uh, muscles. And in the lower region, they actually uh, allow you to control uh, some of your uh, viscera too, like bowel and bladder function, things like that. This is just to show you that there are some normal curvatures to the spine. So we have what's called a lumbar lordosis normally by the time we're adults. Uh, same thing with the cervical spine. We have a cervical lordosis or a backwards curvature. Uh, and then we have what's called a thoracic kyphosis where the, the, the mid back kind of curves forward. And this is normal. Now, if any of these get you know, out of the normal range, then that can be you know, considered a spinal deformity. Just kind of briefly going over the anatomy of the bones. I don't expect you guys to, to remember all this and, and, uh, and 
don't worry, I'm not gonna, you know, pimp you on this or anything. We'll, we'll, we'll ask some questions as we get to the cases, but um, this is more just so you kind of have an introduction to, to kind of what uh, we deal with in the spine. Um, so this up here is, this is just a, a single vertebrae, and this happens to be a vertebrae from the, the lumbar spine or the low back. And um, up here you have what's called the body, um, and on the body rests the disc, which we'll talk about um, a little bit later. Um, back here lies all the spinal kind of nerve elements. In the lumbar spine, we have what's called the caudoquina. Uh, so at this point, it's not spinal cord. It's these individual nerves um, that are kind of sitting in a sack of fluid, and we call that the caudoquina. Uh, and so they're all kind of hanging out in here. Um, the pedicle is a big kind of pillar of bone, and the reason why this is important is that this is actually where we shoot screws through. So if we're trying to fuse the spine, we'll actually shoot, shoot screws through the pedicles uh, into the body to, um, to anchor the spine together. And then all these little pro um, processes are just attachment points for uh, muscles and spine. And then when you kind of feel your back or you feel somebody else, else's back and, and you, you, know, you feel what's, what you think is the spine, this is what you're feeling right here is the spinous process. So all the other stuff is much deeper to that. It's covered in you know, thick muscle, uh, fat, and skin. Uh, and then at most you can feel this um, through palpation or, or just touching somebody or touching your own back. Disc is a very important structure. Um, so as I said, it lies on the vertebral body uh, and it's basically like a, like a jelly donut. So the outside is formed of what's called the annulus fibrosis. It's kind of a thick uh, collagenous um, strong structure and the inside uh, is filled with uh, what's called the nucleus pulposus. And the nucleus pulposus is made of uh, about 80 to 90% water. And the idea here is that it acts as a shock absorber. So when you are standing, um, you know, it, it allows for some compression. So you don't have this like incredibly stiff spine, right? So it actually has some give. And in fact, what's interesting is, is that if you stand all day, um, at the end of the day, you're actually shorter because the water gets pushed out. It diffuses through what are called the end plates. Um, the water gets pushed out of the disc into the end plates to the bone here. And so you actually get shorter at the end of the day. You're about an inch shorter depending on your height, uh, which, which uh, you know, sucks for me because I'm not that tall to begin with. Uh, but in the morning after you sleep, uh, that disc fills back up with water and, and you're, you're an inch taller again. The reason why the disc is important because this is where a lot of the issues in the spine kind of stem from. So you can get a disc herniation where this like gel gel gelatinous material pops out the back and pinches on a nerve back here. Um, actually, when we talk about arthritis in the back, the problem is that disc actually wears out. So you guys may have heard of like arthritis in the hip or the knee or the fingers. Um, in those cases, it's the cartilage within the joint that kind of wears down with time the equivalent of that in the spine is that the disc actually wears out. So the disc you know, dries out and then what ends up happening is that you build up bone spurs and then these little joints in the back called the facet joints have to work harder. And so just like you go to the gym, you know, maybe, maybe some of the guys go to the gym, girls go to the gym to kind of put on muscle. Um, if the facet joints have to do more work because the disc is worn out, they get bigger, they get what's called hypertrophy. They build up bone spurs, and they start to pinch on the nerves back here. And that's where we start to get some of the problems that we see uh, in arthritis of the spine. And a lot of the, the surgeries that we do uh, are a result of that. Uh, again, just to kind of show you, um, I don't think I have any cases that I'm showing you with uh, the use of pedicle screws, but we use a lot of pedicle screws in, in spine where we just shove these screws through these pillars of bone um, to anchor, uh, Know, bones to, to, to anchor basically vertebra to one another. So like a screw would be here, a screw would be here. We put a rod in between uh, to, to what we call fuse the spine. So this is, this is just to kind of illustrate that. And just to show you that millimeters do matter. So right here, if you shoot that screw in the wrong way, uh, in the wrong direction, you can, you know, you can skewer the nerves or the spinal cord depending on where you are. So Again, anatomy really counts in spine, and, and that's, that's why you know, I find it so fascinating. Just to show you, you know, tons of pedicle screws being put in uh, this patient here with rods. These screws are actually in the pelvis, the ones way, way in the bottom. 
So again, just to kind of show you what happens with arthritis. So, so this is a regular disc, nice and tall. You know, the nerves are nice and free. The joint looks nice here, what we call the facet joint. They're like, like, it's like a mini knee, right? In the, in the back of the spine. What happens is the disc wears out. The disc normally handles 80% of the load of the body, particularly in the low back. And so when that disc wears out, these guys have to work harder and when they work harder, they start to wear out, they get thicker, they hypertrophy, and then that pinches on nerves, causes pain. Uh, and, and that's really, again, a lot of what we treat in spine surgery is kind of the consequences of that disc wearing out, which we call degenerative disc disease, basically arthritis of the spine. So again, um, just to kind of illustrate, you know, not only does the spine keep us nice and upright, but it protects all the, the nerve structures, which is really the, uh, the more important function in my head. Um, obviously, I want to up, you know, walk upright. So I guess, I guess they're both important. Um, but uh, they protect, it protects the nerves. And you can kind of see here, this is kind of what the nerves and the spinal cord would look like within the spine. And that vertebral canal um, that canal of, that exists within the bone, that little that opening is actually biggest in the cervical spine or the neck because that's where the uh, spinal cord uh, is largest. Um, so just something to kind of keep in mind. Um, just kind of going briefly over the, the uh, regional anatomy, meaning, so let's talk about the neck, let's talk about the mid back, let's talk about the low back and how the bones differ. Um, just briefly uh, in the neck, um, things are just smaller, right? You know, the, the neck really only has to support the head. Uh, so unless your head is huge, uh, typically these bones are, are pretty small. Um, and again, the vertebral foramen or where the nerves and spinal cord live in the cervical spine is largest because at this level, you're dealing with the spinal cord, um, the biggest part of the spinal cord, which is a direct extension of the brain. And so it needs more room. And honestly, it just needs more cushioning. So again, just kind of showing you, um, this is cervical spine again, or the neck, spinal cords living back here. And then off the spinal cord come the nerves at each level on each side that um, control a different part uh, of our upper extremity. So each one of the nerves at each one of those numbered levels allows us to feel a different part, patch of skin in our arms, um, and then also controls a specific uh, group of muscles. Uh, and so that, that what happens is one of these nerves, if one of these nerves get pinched, um, then somebody might have pain in that region where that nerve normally allows you to feel, uh, or some of those muscles may get um, weak. And, and again, that, that's, you know, basically what you know, we treat in spine surgery to a large degree. I skipped the thoracic spine, but just know the thoracic spine or the mid back. The main thing to know about that at this stage is to know that it articulates with the ribs. Um, again, all the ribs come off of the mid back. And, and what that means is that there's not a lot of motion that comes from the mid back. And the other thing is that the, the vertebral foramen is very small there and the spinal cord is there. So if you get a fracture in the thoracic spine, that's a problem because there's not a lot of cushion for that spinal cord. There's not a lot of room for it. So if somebody injures their mid back um, because they're in a car accident or something like that, you have to be very, um, worried about, you know, potential spinal cord injury. Lumbar or low back, um, as you can imagine, this is the part of the spine that, you know, has to support the, the vast majority of the weight of the body. And so uh, it does tend to, you know, these, these vertebrae are bigger. So they've got big bodies, you know, these big processes where, you know, these powerful kind of muscles attached to uh, the vertebral foramen is here, smaller than it is in the spinal, um, or sorry, in the cervical spine. Uh, and at this level, again, You've got what's called the cauda equina, or that uh, kind of clump of nerves that comes down and controls our, uh, our legs, uh, bowel and bladder, things like that. So let's talk about uh, a couple conditions uh, of the spine. Um, we'll start with one, and then uh, we'll, we'll talk about a case um, that's kind of relevant to it. And then uh, talk about one more condition and uh, another case. and. Uh, and we'll finish up. So at this point, maybe we can, um, anybody has any questions, let's see.
So here's a good question. Do you find working in clinics offers more challenging cases than in a hospital or academic setting? Are the cases you see more broad or specialized in a clinic? Do you ever collaborate? Sorry for the, the background noise. Do you ever collaborate with neurosurgeons on cases? Uh, is there ever a disagreement uh, on course of action between ortho versus neurosurgeon? I think these are all great questions. So clinic, um, maybe I wasn't clear on this, but clinic is part of everybody's practice, whether you're in private practice, a hospital setting or academic setting, everybody that would, if you're a spine surgeon, you do clinic. I mean, that, that's, uh, you know, you have to see your patients that, you know, are following up with you um, after having surgery. Um, I think it would be very rare for a spine surgeon not to have clinic. So clinic is basically the non kind of surgeon, non-operative care of, uh, you know, patients. So um, everybody does clinic. Um, yes, uh, there is collaboration between neurosurgeons and orthopedic spine on cases. Um, actually, pretty commonly. Um, and, and this is kind of, you know, moving forward, I think, going to be the model within spine surgery. Um, so in academic centers, centers a lot in you know, big academic centers like UCSF, uh, you know, um, USC, Duke, uh, you know, Cleveland Clinic, you know, so on and so forth. A lot of times the, the orthopedic and neurosurgeons are working together on cases. I think, you know, most cases, if they're doing this, they're pretty collegial. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't really look at it between a disagreement uh, between an orthopedic versus a neurosurgeon. I think you're going to have disagreement in general between, you know, docs. Uh, and so whether they're ortho, neuro, um, you know, you're going to have disagreements in terms of course of action between various spine surgeons. But again, at the end of the day, a spine surgeon is a spine surgeon. I trained with both neurosurgeons and orthopedic guys. Um, and, you know, my, I have neurosurgical friends that have trained with both, both obviously neurosurgeons and also uh, orthopedic guys. So, at the end of the day, nowadays, the end product is, is the same. Uh, one more question here. How often is new surgical technology incorporated into your OR? How often do you have to complete training for new equipment? You know, this is, this is a great question. Again, in spine, that's kind of the thing that's really fascinating to me is that, you know, it's, it's like the middle ages of spine surgery was, was up until about, you know, 15 to 20 years ago. You know, and, and really in the last 10, 15 years, there's been a, just a huge explosion in our understanding of spine, not only from a research standpoint, um, but there's also been this just huge jump in the number of technologies that we have available. So technologies are always, always coming at us. And um, I think that's fascinating. But at the same time, it can be a little scary, right? You've got all these new technologies. How do you know which one's the right one? How do you keep up? And I think... You know, one thing that I always tell, you know, medical students or, or residents is this is where I think research gets to be so important. If you don't know how to really differentiate between what's good and what's bad, you may be using new technologies or, you know, listening to, you know, research that may not be that great and incorporating these things into your practice. And they may not be the best thing for your patient. So when it comes to to new technologies, you got to look at the research. If it's super new and there's no research, um, maybe be a little bit slower to incorporate those things into your practice. I mean, that's what I'm going to do, particularly as a younger surgeon, kind of let the, uh, the veterans experiment with it, if you will. Um, but, you know, that's kind of the name of the game. When you've got this much new surgical technology, um, you, you got to be careful at how you incorporate it into your OR. And so some of these things like the robot, you know, they're kind of new, but they've been around for a while and only now are people, you know, starting to kind of incorporate it more um, because the, the data is getting better. How often do you have to complete training for new equipment? You know, it's, 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 it's actually kind of scary. That there's not a lot of training that you have to do. Like to use a robot, it's like a, I don't know, a few hour course to go, you know, and, and learn how to use it. Um, so, I mean, some, some companies, you know, uh, require you to do that, but uh, it's not always the case. It's kind of scary, actually. Um, but I would say bottom line is just be wary about new stuff um, and, and really make sure at the end of the day, you're doing the best thing for the patient.
All right, so let's talk about cervical myelopathy. You know, you guys are gonna hear about radiculopathy and pinched nerves in the neck and, and low back. And, and I think that this is something that, you know, most everybody kind of knows, but I wanted to kind of introduce to you guys um, some of the maybe less commonly known uh, conditions of the spine that, that I think um, you know, many people don't recognize and, and maybe, you know, maybe needs more awareness uh, around them. So cervical myelopathy is one of those conditions that I think uh, is important to know about that maybe not a lot of people know about. The main thing to know here is that it's a clinical diagnosis. Um, and what that means is that there's no imaging study or, you know, lab test or, you know, something like that that's going to, you know, make this diagnosis for you. Now, it's going to help, but at the end of the day, it's kind of up to you uh, based on the history mainly the history and the physical exam to kind of figure out that this is what you're dealing with. And I think this is why it's so commonly missed um, is because people don't realize this. Now, what happens in myelopathy is that basically the, the spinal cord gets compressed. The most common reason for that is arthritis. So uh, kind of going back to that illustration of, um, you know, disc wearing out and, and, you know, the bone spurs forming and causing pressure on the nerves. Um, so that, that is the most common reason why the spinal cord gets compressed, um, particularly in the neck. And so cervical spondylotic myelopathy, which basically some person just wanted to make this sound super complex, but it's basically myelopathy as a result of arthritis in the neck, counts for the most, most cases of, of this condition. And so again, this is a, you know, a lot here, but basically spinal cords living in the, in the cervical spine. And if all these things kind of become arthritic, the disc starts coming backwards here. These guys get all thickened. It can pinch on the spinal cord. And as you know, as you might know, as you might even guess, the spinal cord is very important for function of you know, the entire body. So if you, the spinal cord's pinched, that's a big problem. And that causes myelopathy. So again, just to kind of go over how, uh, how arthritis occurs, it starts with a disc uh, kind of wearing out. And then again, the guys in the back, those little joints in the back have to work harder. And so they get uh, thickened and, and bigger and uh, you get what's called stenosis or narrowing of the area where that spinal cord is. And this, this happens all up and down the spine. This is why nerves get pinched in the spine. But as far as myelopathy goes, this is what leads to the pinching in the spinal cord. So you can kind of see that that's what's being illustrated here. You've got all this stuff that's kind of getting thick and it's starting to pinch on the spinal cord here and that's what causes uh, problems. Now, the differential for myelopathy is, is pretty broad. Um, differential meaning the patient comes in and you know, they've got you know, these symptoms, which we'll go over what they are. Um, there's a lot of different things that can cause this, right? Some people even chalk up some of these symptoms to just old age, which is why a lot of the times this is missed. And the problem with that is that this is a progressive condition that if not addressed early can lead to you know, even paralysis. So I've seen patients come into the uh, clinic that are literally just wheelchair bound and have been that way. Their hands don't function um, because they've had um, chronic spinal cord compression and nobody ever picked it up. But this is why, again, clinic becomes so fascinating to me because, you know, you, you still have to, you know, surgeons often, you know, you just worry about surgery and then orthopedic kind of gets a bad rap for this because, you know, uh, we don't basically see a, you know, broken bone. You want to fix that. You don't really care about the medical problems, but in spine, you, you have to kind of keep these things in the back of your mind. So, you know, a patient comes in and you're thinking myelopathy, well, you have to be sure to kind of um, be thinking about these other things too. So from a historical standpoint, meaning what the patient tells you, um, the things that you really want to look out for, there's a lot of things here, but the main things are, is their hand functioning or hand function getting worse? So things that I typically will ask are, hey, have you had any trouble, you know, picking up small objects, buttoning buttons? Do you feel like your handwriting's getting worse? Um, do you have difficulty with uh, jewelry? Do you feel like you're dropping things? So any sort of sign that their, their manual kind of dexterity is declining is 
pointing towards potentially uh, cervical myelopathy as being a, a problem. Um, oftentimes these patients will say that they feel a little bit off balance too. So I'll often ask about, you know, hey, do you feel like your balance is getting worse? Do you feel like, you know, you've had any falls um, more recently than, than not? And, and, and you'll be surprised, you know, if you ask them that, they may not even have been picking up on these things, but when you ask them, they're like, you know what? Yeah, I, I just, I, I don't feel like I'm, you know, I have the balance that I used to. Um, and, you know, it's, it's important to kind of ask these questions because again, it's important to catch this early. You don't want to get them when they're, you know, falling over or can't even walk. Late stage, they may even get some bowel or bladder incontinence. So they may have trouble going to the bathroom. They may, you know, uh, be stooling themselves or urinating on themselves because again, the spinal cord con controls everything from the neck down uh, at the level of the neck, including the bowel and bladder. So those are symptoms. And the symptoms are more important. So symptoms being what the patient describes to you as things that they're kind of dealing with. Signs are actually objective findings. So things that we'll you know, examine uh, in the office um, to, to, to see whether or not these patients have myelopathy. And in fact, 20 to 30% of people that have cervical myelopathy don't actually have any myelopathic signs. So, they may be complaining about difficulty with, you know, manual dexterity, you know, gait instability, you know, they may have even some incontinence, and then you examine them and their exam is completely normal. And, and you have to be careful of that. You have to remember that 20 to 30% of these people may not have any objective physical exam findings for this. So you don't have to remember all of this stuff, but just remember that this thing is out there and just something to kind of keep in mind in the back of your head as you move forward in your careers. The problem with cervical myelopathy or myelopathy in general, myelopathy just meaning a dysfunction of the, the kind of um, spinal cord and, or, or brain even, um, it, it's usually a, a progressive condition. It will progress. So um, if you leave it, it'll get worse. And we can't predict you know, when that happens or how severe that progression is gonna be. So for instance, you may see a patient in clinic and they may say, well, yeah, I've got some mild symptoms, you know, I, I feel like, yeah, I'm a little clumsier in the hands. My, my, my gait is a little bit, you know, off, but it's not that I can, I can get by. You get an MRI and they've got, you know, significant cord compression, which is not abnormal to see or not unusual to see that. And so the question is, is in those very mild cases, do you rush into surgery or do you say, Hey, let's just kind of watch this. The problem is we don't know when is, that, when, when, is, when is that actually gonna progress? So, I mean, they could come back in three months and, and be wheelchair bound even. Now, that's not always the case, um, but it certainly can happen. So that's the kind of scary thing about cervical myelopathy is we just never know, uh, you know, how fast and how severe the progression is going to be. But when it progresses, um, it tends to be, a lot of the time you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to reverse those changes with surgery. Now, they will get better with surgery, but they may not fully get better. And that, that's, you know, that's the sad part of it. So it's best to kind of catch this early on. And if they've got bowel or bladder issues, that's, that's typically a, a bad prognosis. That means it's, it's chronic. Uh, and anytime you have any sort of chronic nerve or spinal cord issue, um, oftentimes that means that uh, that nerve or spinal cord uh, won't have a good chance of recovery. So it's usually a bad sign. So, uh, you know, spine is complex. I don't, don't want to, you know, get too much into the weeds here, but just know that again, at every single level of the spine, you know, particularly in the neck and the low back, you've got a set of nerves that comes off and, and you know, allows uh, for the, you know, control of a very, you know, a specific group of muscles or allows us to feel in a, in a particular part of the arm uh, or the leg. Obviously in the neck, we're, we're talking about the arm and um, so on and so forth. So this is just kind of illustrating what, you, what each of those nerves do and how you test that. And then in the low back, kind of same thing. You have to test a different group of muscles, test the sensation, test different reflexes to kind of localize where the problem is. And this is what's called a dermatomal map. So every nerve 
pair of nerve in the body that comes off the neck or the low back or even the mid back controls a different part of the skin. So it allows you to feel in a different part of the body. So you know, if you've got a pinched nerve in the neck or the low back or even the, in the mid back, you can kind of localize where that is based off of where their pain is. But you can also see, just to kind of emphasize here, the importance of kind of understanding um, not only this, but understanding the extremity issues, right? Like you can get knee arthritis that can cause pain here, but that's also an L4, right? You can have hip arthritis that causes groin pain, but that's also an L1 issue. Um, and so that, that's where, again, the, the clinical aspect of spine, I think, is, is, is so, I don't know, fascinating and, and, uh, and challenging. And sometimes you, you, you just have to be able to figure that out. So for cervical myelopathy um, or any sort of uh, kind of brain or spinal cord issue, you obviously want to do a gait analysis. Uh, oftentimes, these patients will have difficulty uh, with toe-to-heel walk. So basically, a sobriety test. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll have them do a sobriety test and they just can't do it. They come off balance. The Romberg test is um, uh, basically testing uh, their sense of uh, position or proprioception. Um, and basically what you do here is you have them stand with their feet uh, together, uh, eyes closed, hands up or down. And the idea here is that you're taking away their, their ability to see themselves in space, right? So we have different ways of kind of uh, adjusting our balance or kind of you know, understanding where we are in space. And so if you take away the eyes, we, they can't see where they actually are and they've got an issue with, um, you know, their spinal cord, um, particularly their position sense, you're gonna see that they can't do this. They'll, they'll, they'll basically get off balance when you ask them to do this test. The Hoffman's test is, or sign is, is something that uh, I think a lot of people don't know. Um, you know, we, we use a lot of it in spine, but it's kind of an interesting uh, sign that does indicate uh, potentially um, a spinal cord issue. And the idea here is that you flick the middle, you, you, you basically stabilize the finger, you flick the, the, the middle, the, the end of the middle finger, and then they get this reflexive, like uh, flexion of the thumb and the index finger. And, uh, and that can indicate uh, an issue of the spinal cord. So we'll, we'll test that. Their meets phenomenon is, um, it's basically the idea here is that when you, when, when a patient flexes their neck forward or extends their neck, it actually uh, narrows the diameter for the spinal cord. Uh, and so if there's already narrowing of that diameter and you do this, you kind of exacerbate that and they'll get this like electric sensation going down their spine, um, even into their arms or legs. And so this, this may be uh, indicative of uh, spinal cord uh, compression. Rabinsky is again uh, kind of gives us an idea of whether or not the spinal cord is functioning. So let's get into the cases. Are there any questions at this point? All right, let's just get going with the first case here. So we've got a 61 year old male comes in with a chief complaint of neck pain. Uh, that's been uh, worsening over the last um, three years. You know, I don't, I don't know how much uh, history taking or clinic you guys have seen, but what, what would you, what would you want to uh, ask this patient? Kind of given given that we're probably dealing with a my, cervical myelopathy patient, what what do you want to ask? Dr. Chung, just so you know, there's a 30 second lag between when um, you ask a question and the responses start coming in. So you may just have to wait a second. Okay. So in the meantime, there's a question, what are some examples of things you do to help educate patients and engage them in their treatment process? You know, I, I think a lot of this um, starts with just kind of building that rapport with the patients uh, to begin with. You know, you, I don't know, I think in surgery, we have this bad rap of, you know, just kind of being surgeons, walking in, telling people what to do and, and uh, really not being a doctor. And I think that's a mistake. Um, I really do think that you, know, you need to get, get in there, pretend it's a family member or friend and, and, and really engage them. Uh, and, and a lot of that, I think, helps with the, the process of education. 
you have to remember that, you know, we get so used to dealing with people uh, in, who are, who are well-educated, who, um, and not to say that people outside of, you know, what we deal with are not well-educated, because there's tons of obviously well-educated people outside of what we do. But I think we get so used to like being in this environment where everybody understands how we talk, right? We all use medical terminology and so on and so forth. I think it's very important to realize that most people don't understand medical technology or, or terminology, and, and you really have to be very good with your words. You just have to assume that, you know, you're, you, you almost want to use like seven, you know, like you're, you're talking to like a, you know, a seventh or eighth grader. Like, how would you simplify what you're trying to convey in order to explain that to a seventh or eighth grader? Because you have to, you have to remember that you're not only are you using fancy terminology, but you're also giving them a lot of information. So you have to make it as easy as possible for those patients to understand what it is that you're saying. And then you build the rapport as well. And that I think kind of kickstarts the whole education process. Then the patients are engaged. They understand what you're saying. And then it's a matter of, at least in, in, in my, in the way that I kind of talk to patients or care for patients, it's, it's a team approach. It's like, Hey, Here's what we need to do to, you know, get you to where you want to be. And whether that's surgery or, or non-operative care, you know, those are all things that you end up kind of discussing with the patient. But I do think it starts with understanding how to communicate with the patient and to initially kind of build that relationship. And I think as surgeons, you know, traditionally we've kind of failed at that. Um, and I think a lot of us are getting better. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind as you move forward in your career. Yeah, so somebody said pain scale for this question here, pain scale, pain history, what makes the pain worse? How is the hand functioning? Family history, balance issues, pain quality. 100% agree, those are all great things. So clearly the patient has neck pain. They don't have any, he doesn't have any radicular symptoms. So nothing shooting down the arms. But he does say that over the last five months, He's, he's kind of been off balance. It feels like every now and then he, he may even fall or, you know, have to catch himself because he, you know, he kind of, you know, stumbles, um, which is unusual for him. Um, and then he, he states that, he, you know, he has some difficulty, you know, buttoning buttons now and, and he's finding that his, you know, handwriting or penmanship's getting worse. And so these are all a little bit concerning, right? Just kind of given, given what we've talked about for uh, myelopathy. So another thing you might want to ask is, you know, what treatments has he tried, right? So he's done some physical therapy, he's taken some anti-inflammatory or NSAIDs, NSAIDs means, uh, or stands for non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory based medica medications. Uh, so ibuprofen, you know, things like that. So past history, um, he's, uh, he's had coronary artery disease or, or basically, you know, blocked vessels in the heart. I had like a, a, a heart attack and got some stents. Um, he also complains of a uh, history of vertigo. He endorses a history of vertigo. Vertigo means that he's got maybe an inner ear issue where the room kind of spins around him. And so oftentimes this is kind of hard to, again, you know, this is where kind of the, the clinical aspect of spine becomes so interesting is because people with vertigo feel like the room's spinning around them from time to time and, and they can get off balance just because of that. So how do you differentiate between that and something like cervical myelopathy? And so in this case, he's got hand issues, right? Manual dexterity issues. So that would be you know, one clear sign. He's taken Tylenol, he's taken aspirin. Uh, you know, other things you wanna ask are kind of his social history, right? So what does he do for work? Is he a smoker? Cause that does affect, you know, maybe some of the, uh, the surgery that we do and, and the outcomes that we expect. Uh, and then he has no uh, allergies to anything that we know. So what do you guys wanna do next? So I, I think we're kind of going long here. So I'm just gonna push forward. So we're gonna examine the patient. Again, patient's got full strength throughout, which isn't, which, which isn't again, uh, unusual. Um, He's got some numbness in the C8 dermatome. C8 being kind of the, the pinky finger uh, inside of the forearm uh, and it's on both sides. And he's got that Hoffman sign on both, both, both hands. 
Uh, so you flick the middle finger and he does that reflexive um, flexion of the index finger and thumb. And then he has a tough time with uh, the, the, the sobriety test. So, so something's, something's off here and, and, and you have to start thinking about uh, cervical myelopathy. So I just want you guys to think about what you guys would, would do next at this point. Now, obviously he's, he's in a spine clinic. So at this point, you know, we're, we're gonna want imaging. So typically we start with x-rays. And then in this case, you know, by the time this guy probably got to us, you know, he probably already has x-rays. And so he may even have an MRI. And so we would order an MRI. MRI being a mag magnetic uh, resonance imaging and allows us to really visualize uh, the nerves and uh, so on and so forth, soft tissue structures. X-rays are really good at bone. Um, or X-rays are really good for us uh, to, to evaluate kind of the bony structures. So this is looking at him from the side and from the front. Here's the neck. Here's the neck looking at it from the side. Here's his jaw. Um, and, you know, basically I'm gonna point out here, this is a normal disc, this is a normal disc. You can't see the disc, but you can see the space in between the bones. And you can see here that that space has kind of decreased. And then he's building up these like bone spurs back here. The AP or the front back view uh, for the x-ray, you know, really just gives us a sense of the alignment of the neck. His alignment's actually pretty good. So we get an MRI and this is what we see. And just kind of point things out here. We're looking at the patient from the side. This is called a sagittal view of the neck. Here are the uh, vertebrae of the neck. And then here are the discs. And you can see that these discs are really worn out. And if you just look here, here's spinal cord. And normally it's surrounded by what we call cerebrospinal fluid or this kind of white stuff. And uh, you can see that there's fluid in between the spinal cord and, and the bones front and the back, same thing here, but at this level, there's a lot of narrowing. You can, it's, it's, it's not hard to see that the spinal cord is getting pinched here, right? And this would be at the uh, two, three, four, five, six level. So at the C5, six level, he has spinal cord pinching. And the other thing you can see here is that look how gray the spinal cord is, right? So the, the neural kind of anatomy is normally gray, but at this point it's, it's gotten white. And that's, that's an indication of scarring or inflammation of the spinal cord. We call that myelomalacia. So basically the spinal cord is being damaged. Um, and then this is kind of showing a, a cross section at that view. So if you were to uh, kind of cut the neck straight across and look down on the patient, um, this is looking right at that level Normally, the spinal cord should have a ton of space here. It should be surrounded by fluid, but you can see that it's just getting pinched, right? It's getting pinched by all the arthritis that's kind of happening around it. Um, so bottom line is this patient has cervical myelopathy with evidence on his MRI that this indeed is the case. This is, this is the culprit. The spinal cord's getting pinched because of arthritis in the neck, and that's the cause of his problems. So what do you wanna do? So again, we kind of talked about before that you have to have a conversation with the patient. I think in this case, he's developing symptoms. He's got very severe uh, compression on MRI. I think in this case, I would advise this patient to, to have surgery sooner than later. And the way that I would discuss that is, <clears throat> as I kind of alluded to before, you know, I would discuss the condition with the patient and I would say, Here's what happens with this condition. It's cervical myelopathy, it's a progressive disease. It, tends, it, it, it doesn't get better, it only tends to get worse. We can't predict what that course is gonna be. You may, despite your MRI findings, for the rest of your life, just be where you're at right now, but probably more often than not, what we find is over a course of four or five years, 50% of people or so tend to get worse and worse. And we don't know when that's gonna happen. We don't know how severe that progression will be when it happens. And so there is a chance that you come back to us in five years and you're in a wheelchair. Now, I know that's not, I, I hope that's not the case for you, but if you were my family member, I would probably recommend that we get this addressed surgically. So that, that's kind of what I would discuss with them. And then of course, I would discuss the, the risks and benefits of a surgery. 
and there's different ways to address this, but we ultimately ended up doing a, uh, what's called a C56 anterior cervical uh, discectomy uh, infusion. So basically the idea here is we go in there from the front and uh, basically spread between these two muscle planes here. Um, a lot of kind of important structures here, uh, but we get through there, get down to the spine, we clear out that bad disc, we clear out the arthritis from the front, uh, and then put a spacer um, right in between the bones and then put a plate and screws on the front to, to allow those bones to kind of heal together. And uh, here's a, a short video kind of illustrating what we're doing here is basically uh, looking down a microscope into the um, actual disc space that we've cleared out. And now we're just kind of removing some of that junk uh, off of the spinal cord. Um, so again, you can see how precise that is. And the spinal cord's very uh, sensitive to uh, any sort of manipulation. So if you, again, if you move a millimeter or two in the wrong direction, like for instance, if you go too deep with your instrumentation, if you're not super precise, um, you can punch the cord and, and that patient be paralyzed. So again, why, why spinal surgery I think is, is, is so cool. I'm gonna fast forward here. So we've kind of cleared out the disc uh, and now this is us putting some of the instrumentation in. Uh, so basically what we do is we pre-drill some holes for that plate and screws that's gonna be going on uh, a little bit later. So what we're doing here, so drilling some holes. And that stuff that we put in there is just uh, uh, some, uh, it's called flow seal. It basically um, tries to induce clotting so that a uh, patient doesn't bleed through uh, these holes that we're drilling. Now we're putting the implant in and this is a, there's, there's all sorts of different implants out there, like I kind of alluded to, a lot of different technologies. This is a, um, this was a, a, a peak cage, I believe, uh, which is a plastic cage, and we kind of filled it with some uh, bony product to allow those bones to kind of heal to one another. And then again, at the end, we would take these out, put, plates, put a plate and screws to kind of uh, hold everything together. All right, how much time do I have? Do I have time for another case, you think? So if yeah, you want... I think you do. All right, let's go for going. it. And now I'll take questions at the end, just so we can get through the last case here. Um, so another um, kind of equivalent of uh, arthritis in the neck that can occur in the spine. So again, um, when arthritis occurs, that, that the, the amount of space for those nerves um, uh, gets, uh, gets to be less and those nerves get pinched or the spinal cord gets pinched depending on where you are in the spine. Um, so in the lumbar spine, what, what happens is the, the nerves get pinched and we call that lumbar spinal stenosis uh, when, uh, and most, most often it's because of arthritis. Again, arthritis builds up, kind of pinches on those nerves um, and uh, it can cause can obviously cause some problems with those nerves, right? And uh, again, it's most commonly the result of um, either bone or the ligaments kind of getting thicker, uh, just taking up the space uh, that the nerves normally would have. So this is just an illustration. It's a gross uh, anatomy specimen looking at the, the spine here. Again, this is the, the body up front. This is the stuff in the back. This is actually the cross section of the joint here, the facet joint, the little knee joint back here. Um, Here's where the nerves live. Um, this is just kind of showing that you can define spinal stenosis based on where it occurs. So it'd be central here, lateral, uh, pyraminal, uh, extra pyraminal stenosis. Um, nothing you guys need to worry about, but just know that that does change to some degree how we address, uh, how we address that stenosis. So again, stenosis is just a consequence oftentimes of arthritis. Okay? So it starts with the disc wearing out and then the little joints in the back have to work harder, they get thickened, they get bigger, and they take up the space for the nerves and the nerves get pinched and then they don't like it. Um, and so that's all that's being illustrated here. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys now.
Now, what's interesting about spinal stenosis is that because it's like a, a uniform compression of that entire nerve sac, uh, oftentimes you don't get like the traditional, you know, sciatica that you would get if you had like a, what we call a lumbar radiculopathy. Um, so if you have a single nerve in the back that's pinched, you know, typically you're going to get, you know, pain in that dermatomal distribution of that nerve. When all of the nerves are pinched, like they do get in spinal stenosis, um, you get kind of a different clinical picture. And we call this clinical picture uh, neurogenic claudication. So these patients, when they walk, they'll get this like cramping, fatigue, or pain in their legs, you know, thighs, maybe even going down into the calves, uh, worse with ambulation. And then they actually get better when they rest. But interestingly, a lot of these patients actually get better uh, when they lean forward. And the reason for this is when they lean forward, it actually increases the amount of space for those nerves. So it kind of makes them feel better for a minute. So these patients oftentimes, you know, will say, hey, when I go to the grocery and I push a shopping cart and I'm leaning on a grocery cart, I can actually walk pretty well. But when I'm not using a grocery cart, when I'm just walking around the neighborhood, you know, I just get this cramping or um, you know, a weak feeling of weakness or, or pain in the thighs or, or the calves. But when I sit down, it's not there. Now, this thing that's bolded here, I mentioned that because patients who've got vascular issues, so they've got, uh, maybe they're a smoker, right? And so they've got bad vessels, they've got bad piping, and they're not getting enough blood to the muscles. These patients also, when they walk, will also get pain. But these patients won't get relief if they lean forward. Okay. Now, this isn't, it's not like all patients with neurogenic claudication, you know, get better uh, when they lean forward, but just something that, that can help you um, make, that, make that distinction. And again, maybe hard to distinguish from vascular claudication, where again, the piping is clogged and they're not getting enough blood to the muscles, because in these cases, pain also occurs when they walk. Um, they also get you know, relief of pain when they stop walking because now the muscles don't need the blood. Um, but these patients will typically have like some nighttime pain and it may even get better when they hang the legs, uh, hang their legs over the bed because that improves blood flow. Um, and, and if you are thinking this, um, then one of the ways you can kind of make that distinction is by uh, actually getting them on a bicycle and, uh, and, and uh, pedaling. Uh, so we call this the bicycle treadmill test. So the idea here is that with neurogenic claudication, they're leaning forward when they cycle, right? And so that actually opens up the space for the nerves. They're still able to cycle without any problem. But patients who have vascular claudication, again, it's a piping issue. So whether they're walking or, or cycling, if the muscles aren't getting blood, it's going to hurt. So these patients, when they get on the bicycle and they pedal, they're going to have pain. And that's how you distinguish between the two. One of the ways that you make a distinction between the two. I hope that makes sense. So just, again, to kind of review the, the, the neurologic exam for the lower extremity, dermatomal maps. And again, this is why in lumbar spinal stenosis, if they have neurogenic claudication, when they lean forward, they actually feel better because it actually frees up space uh, for those nerves. And then when they lean backwards or they're walking, normally they want to lean backwards the, the ligaments are, are thickened and they're actually redundant. So they actually kind of come into the, the spinal canal and that's when their symptoms are the worst. So if you take anything out of any sort of historical clue that you need to pay attention to when, when looking for neurogenic claudication um, out of this presentation, I hope you get that. So let's move into the next case. So this is a 77 year old guy uh, worsening leg pain over the last two years. He's got some back pain, but his main issue is, is leg pain. So I want you to think about, just kind of given what we've talked about, what are some of the questions you would want to ask this patient? And just for the sake of time, I, you know, we'll just move forward here. And then, you know, I didn't talk about this um, uh, a whole lot uh, yet, um, but anytime you have nerve pinching, um, or anytime you're worried about nerve pinching uh, in the low back, there are some red flags that you absolutely want to rule out. And those are any sort of bowel or bladder issues, 
Um, do they get any numbness or tingling kind of into the, the groin region? Because that is indicative of a condition caused or called uh, cauda equina syndrome. And that, uh, from our standpoint, tends to be a little bit uh, more of an emergency uh, because anytime bowel or bladder function is involved, um, you, you want to address that as fast as you can. So, so those are some other things that you might ask about uh, when you, when you, when you uh, are talking to the patient. So talking to the patient, he's got pain in both legs, thighs, it's worse with walking, feels weak in the legs, um, symptoms are better with sitting. And then when he walks to the shopping cart, right, he feels like he can walk a lot better. Uh, no bowel or bladder incontinence, no saddle anesthesia. One of the ways you can ask about saddle anesthesia is, hey, when you wipe, do you feel, when you, do you feel yourself when you wipe? And so uh, that's, that's a nice kind of screening tool for uh, saddle anesthesia. Saddle anesthesia meaning when you sit on a saddle, the part that would touch the saddle, part of your body that would touch the saddle, that part may get numb in cauda equina syndrome. So that's why we ask about it. He's otherwise healthy. He takes some medications. He's retired. He's a non-smoker, uh, no allergies. So again, just for the sake of time, uh, we would, again, he's in a spine clinic. We're gonna get some x-rays and then, uh, or sorry, we're gonna get an exam. We're gonna do an exam first. Uh, so on exam, he's strong. Uh, he's got full strength throughout and we grade strength on a scale of five, five out of five being the best. He's got sensation in all uh, dermatomes, it's full. He's got diminished reflexes, but they're symmetric in the bilateral lower extremities. So in older individuals, this guy's like 77, their reflex arcs get diminished as they age. They just aren't as uh, profound as they are when they're younger. So this is normal. As long as it's symmetric, um, this is not an unusual finding except for them to have diminished reflexes. And so all in all, this patient has a pretty normal exam despite, you know, obviously what I'm getting at here is that the patient does have neurogenic claudication. And so again, that is not uncommon. Um, so these patients, you gotta talk to them. You gotta talk to them. And, and the history of the taking is, is so important uh, for, for spine. And what else should we examine? So what I was trying to get at here is that, again, is this vascular claudication? So you could always check his pulses. Um, sometimes if they've got vascular, like long-standing, um, sorry, vascular issues, um, it's almost like they don't have the, the irrigation to the lawn, if you will. So what I mean by that is they're not getting blood flow to the legs. And so they may not have hair on their legs or, you know, um, they may have like this kind of shiny looking skin. Um, and and that's, that's another indication that maybe they've got some vascular issues. And obviously if they have like a history of uh, like heart attacks, smoking, you know, things like that, that would kind of make you be a little bit more suspicious that maybe, you know, maybe you should rule out a vascular, vascular etiology of um, uh, his symptoms. But to kind of drill this down, we could get him on a, Bicycle, right? We could do the bicycle treadmill test to, to really differentiate between the two if we were um, concerned about that. So now we're going to get imaging. So we get x rays. Um, so x rays of the thoracolumbar spine. So this is the, again, the thoracic spine. You can see the ribs coming off of it. This is looking at the, looking at the patient on a front back or what we call the AP view. Here are all the lumbar vertebrae. Here's pelvis. This is looking at him from the side. You know, all in all, he's got some pretty decent disc spaces. You know, he's got some degenerative changes throughout. He's got some bone spurs and stuff like that. But something to keep in mind too, and, and uh, you know, moving forward in your careers is that it's like this. If you take a car in that's been, if you take a car into the mechanic that's been driven for five years and it's otherwise functioning fine, right? You're just going for an oil change otherwise functioning fine. That mechanic is gonna find something wrong with your car because it's been driven, it's been worn out. It's the same thing when we order MRIs or X-rays of the spine or really any extremity. So hip, knee, shoulder. All of us have to some degree some arthritis or some tearing of some muscle or tendon in our joints or our spine. This is normal. We may not have any pain 
In fact, once you get past the age of 60 or so, um, about 70, 80% of people will have changes on their MRI or X-ray that are consistent with arthritis, even some bad arthritis, but they may have no symptoms at all. And so again, that's where the, I think the clinic gets to be so interesting is that you really have to listen to your patient. You really have to do a good exam because the X-rays and the MRI for me are not, they don't tell the whole story. They confirm for me what I'm already thinking about based off the history and physical. So I think in medicine, we, we've kind of unfortunately gone towards the route of ordering tests first, interpreting them, and then going to see the patient. I would encourage you guys as you move forward to, to do the opposite, to, to stay, be a doctor first, to listen to your patient, do a good exam, and then use the x-rays and the MRI to confirm or use the tests to confirm what you're thinking and, and not the other way around. Just again, there's a lot of what we call false negatives. There's a lot of findings that you'll see on x-rays and MRIs that really mean nothing. So in this case, this patient, um, this is another MRI. We're looking at him from the side. Here are the bones. Here's the nerves back here living in that um, sack of fluid. And you can kind of see here at this point, this is spinal cord, it's uniform. And at this point, it's just individual nerves. So again, this is what's called cauda equina. It's, it's cauda equina meaning horse's tail. So it's all these nerves kind of coming down here. And you can see here that there's not a lot of room for those nerves. And that's, that's basically what I'm trying to illustrate here is that they're getting pinched. Okay, so, so that's the cause of the symptoms. Um, and uh, in this case, the patient did have neurogenic claudication. Uh, he had been dealing with it for a while. And, and again, this isn't really an emergency. It's more of a quality of life issue. And so you talk to them about that. You say, hey, there's no emergency to this. Is this something that you want to live with? In this case, the patient had been dealing with it for two years. He tried a lot of different things. And he said, you know what? I just want to be able to walk again. And, uh, you know, I'm ready for surgery. So we uh, elected to do surgery for him. And in this case, what you do is you literally just clean off the arthritis around the nerves. And there's different ways to do this. Um, but uh, the way that, that we do it, and, and this is a video for something else, but I'm just going to show you that the procedure is very similar here. The way that we did this particular case was a, a minimally invasive um, decompression. And so we basically dock a tube down to the bone after localizing with x-ray. And then we just start drilling the arthritis off of the nerves. So I'm gonna show you that. And then uh, we'll be done for the day. Under the operating microscope, the landmarks are exposed with monopolar cautery the laminotomy is made starting at the inferior edge of the cephalad lamina and carried out to the superior margin of the ligamentum flavum. The laminotomy can then be widened as necessary. The base of the spinous process is then removed to perform the contralateral laminotomy. Ligamentum flavum is then removed to fully expose the thecal sac. So, that, so that's basically what we do. So again, when you look at the spine from the back, you've got bone, you've got some ligament. And honestly, oftentimes the culprit is the thickened ligament. And so you drill away the bone, you take away the ligament, and then you just make sure that all those nerves are nice and free. And so that, that's what we call the decompression uh, surgery or laminectomy. Uh, but in this case, it's, it's more of call a, um, we'll just call it a decompression. There's all these terms in spine and I don't want to confuse you guys. Um, but this is a minimally invasive decompression. We literally do it through like a, uh, an 18 millimeter, 16 millimeter uh, incision. Uh, so it's really small. Um, so just measure that and, and just kind of think about how cool that is. All right, I'm just gonna run through this real quick just so you guys can see some of the other stuff that we do. So this is a patient who had um, a uh, notable uh, deformity in her neck. You can kind of see here that she's tilted. She's, her normal lordosis in the neck is reversed. She's leaning forward now and she actually can't even look up. So when you look at her full length films, so this is looking at her from the sides, looking at her from the front. One, her head's a little tilted but you can see here that she has to lean back 
in order to even see somewhat forward because her, her chin is literally kind of almost touching her chest because of her deformity in the neck. And so obviously this is not a normal position for the neck. She's not supposed to have that kind of kyphosis or forward bend, bend in the neck. She's supposed to have a lordosis. Um, so uh, what we did for her uh, again is uh, correct that. Um, only reason why I put this here is uh, this patient also had cervical myelopathy uh, because what ends up happening is if you've got this forward curvature in the neck, that spinal cord gets kind of draped over it and over time it just gets stretched. And so even though it's not compressed, because it's starting to stretch, um, that can also cause uh, some dysfunction in the spinal cord. And so this patient actually had uh, cervical myelopathy in addition to her uh, deformity. And so we ended up going in there and basically just realigning her with uh, a bunch of screws and, and rods. So that's, that's kind of a glimpse into my world. Uh, hopefully you guys found it uh, uh, interesting. Um, I just wanna you know, encourage you guys, since you guys are going into uh, medicine, uh, just to remember that you know, it isn't about the money. Um, in fact, if you're going into it for the money, you're gonna be very disappointed. And I, and, and I posted about this on Instagram and it's so true. Um, the reimbursements are going down. It's more work for less money. And so if you don't really love medicine, if you don't really love surgery, there are better ways to make money, better ways to, you know, I don't know, get respect or whatever it is, you know, that other people kind of look for when they go into medicine. Um, so truly make sure that you're going into it for the right reasons. And if you do that, you're going to love it. You're going to, have a, you're going to, you're going to enjoy every minute of it. Stay committed. It's hard work. There's no question. Um, just some other kind of simple tips along the way um, that will make you stand out. You know, when you say you're going to do something, do it. You know, be true to your word. Um, you know, you'd be surprised. There's a lot of people that, you know, agree to do something or say they're going to do something and, and, and don't do it. And um, you know, I'll tell you, if you're, if you're a man or woman of your word, you're going to stand out. You're going to be, you know, better than a lot. Uh, stay humble. You know, you want to be confident. You want to, you know, read up and, and be knowledgeable and be confident in what you're doing, but always stay humble. You can always learn something from somebody. Uh, and then just be thankful along the way. You know, there's a lot of people that are going to help you to kind of get you to where you want to go. Uh, there's a lot of ancillary staff that you deal with and, and that kind of help you uh, as, a, as a doc to, to be able to do what you want to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And just remember those people and be thankful to them. And then most importantly, don't forget to enjoy life. It's okay. You know, it's, it's a tough road that we take. Um, Takes, it's a lot of commitments, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of weddings missed, uh, a lot of, you know, bachelor or bachelorette parties missed. There's a lot of things that get missed, but uh, don't forget to, you know, take some time and, and, and enjoy life when you can. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed the talk. Um, if you guys have any questions at any time, uh, feel free to message me or email me. Um, I'm very interested in education and research. So if you guys ever want to, you know, come shadow or uh, if you're in the Phoenix Scottsdale area, or if you want to get involved in research, uh, I'm sure we can make something happen for you guys. I'm going to pull up the questions here if I can, but let me. It's not letting me pull up the questions here. There we go. Here we go. All right. So, take this one here. So, there's a question asking about OMT. So, do you get the chance to apply OMT to your patients? Um, let's just start with that. Um, not really. Um, I am open to that idea. It's just logistically and in an orthopedic spine practice, you just don't have the time to do that. Um, I guess you could make the time, but uh, it just, it's just never really uh, fit in. But that being said, I'm very, I'm very open to it. And so I will make that recommendation to patients. Um, if they're, you know, if I, I feel like they're not a candidate for surgery or um, we don't need to pursue surgery, if I feel like OMT can be very, a benefit to them or you know, conservative treatments can be a benefit to them, I will certainly recommend OMT. 
Um, for case two, would there be more risk in the surgery if the patient wanted to wait a couple of months before surgery? Not necessarily. So, um, you know, at worst, you know, maybe he could start getting weak uh, in one of the pinched nerves, um, meaning if one of those nerves, you know, maybe supplied uh, the, uh, the ability to raise your foot up into the air, you know, could it be that it came back in three months and, or two months and, and that was weak now because that nerve was pinched? It's possible. Um, but most of the time, um, in those cases, it's really not super urgent that we get to them unless they're having like bowel or bladder issues um, or saddle anesthesia. If they, if they have more of a cauda equina um, picture. Um, you have to remember that in this case, this guy was 77. He's developed arthritis over years. And nerves have a, a, a great way of accommodating the fact that they get less and less, less and less space. So it's like, it's like if you had a, if you lived in a small apartment, right? And over time you accumulated all this stuff, you would learn to make do with the space that you have, the less and less space that you have, right? The decreasing amount of space that you have. But let's say you lived in a small apartment, all of a sudden somebody moved a whole bunch of crap into your apartment. You're not gonna like that, right? And, and you're gonna be shocked as a result of that, right? Because you haven't had time to accommodate. Uh, it's very much the case with, uh, with nerves oftentimes. So yes, he was symptomatic, um, but because he, his nerves had had time to kind of um, accommodate, he probably wasn't as symptomatic as he would be if, for instance, that happened overnight. Like he had a huge disc herniation and it compressed all the nerves overnight. In that case, that patient may have came in and, and may have had bowel or bladder issues. And in those cases, we would take them to surgery sooner than later. Uh, another question here, in case two, would the patient have to ever have this surgery again, or would this permanently fix the problem? That's actually a great question. Um, so this definitely isn't a permanent fix. Uh, again, the, the, the goal of the surgery is really just to take the pressure off the nerves. And, and this really gets uh, into the complexity of spine and, and really is a testament to why uh, spine is, is, is such an interesting field. Um, if you took that seam x-ray MRI to, um, you know, five different spine surgeons, uh, some of them may have fused that patient. So they may have done the decompression like we did, but they may have put screws uh, and rods in uh, to kind of pull the two adjacent bones to one another. Uh, and there are various reasons to, to doing that. And that wouldn't be the wrong answer necessarily. Um, but in this case, because his main symptoms we thought were, um, you know, related to the nerve compression, we thought it'd be best to do the lesser of the two surgeries, spare this guy a big surgery, just take the pressure off the nerve. He's 77, he just wants to walk, just let him walk. And then, you know, we always discuss with him though, hey, there is a chance that you could break down at the levels above and below. There is a chance that, you know, this level becomes unstable and you develop arthritis or pain, uh, worsening arthritis or pain as a result of this, then we have to give you a fusion down the road. And as long as they're in agreement with that, as long as you set those expectations and they say, hey, you know what? I'm okay with not, I'm, I'm okay with not having a big surgery. I'm okay with just you know, giving, giving this a shot. And if I have to come back in five years, seven years, 10 years, and they may never have to come back. But as long as they're okay with that idea, then, then the right thing to do, I think, is in this particular patient is the lesser of the two surgeries. So again, that, that kind of gets into the complexity of the clinical aspect of spine, which again is, is fascinating to me. Thank you so much, Dr. Chung. This was a wonderful presentation. Everyone learned so, so much. Thank you again for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to come here and allow us to learn from you. It was a great presentation. Um, for everyone watching, the Google form has been posted in the chat box and it will be open until 11.35, so another 30 minutes after the session ends. And just a quick announcement, um, like I said at the end of the session yesterday, um, tonight our October roundup start, so starting at 11.59 um, p.m. Eastern time through Sunday at 11.59 p.m., 
you will have access on our website to all of the Google Forms from October. They'll be open again and you can fill them out for any sessions you may have missed live. The only difference with those forms is that you will have to fill them out um, with 10 sentences as your summary. Um, okay, thank you everyone. And today's session will count for 90 minutes. Um, thank you so much again, Dr. Chung. This was thank a wonderful. You.